Good evening and welcome to another edition of This Week in 60 Minutes. I uh, must say welcome to those of you joining us via our Facebook live stream as well. I'm your host, Rui Balgobin. And I am your co-host, Juan Edgel Jr. I want to thank all of our viewers for tuning in this evening. Okay, on tonight's edition of This Week in 60 Minutes, we'll be looking at several issues relating to corruption and the lack of transparency that have been headlining the news for the past week, yes. as well as the development in the process for the appointment of a new chairperson for the Ghana Elections Commission. So over the past two weeks, uh, Rudy, we've seen more and more evidence. Uh, it has been leaked by whistleblowers, uh, decent Guyanese, uh, who are offended by what is taking place on the discoalition government, they have been coming forward with more and more information. Uh, the pattern uh, seen in what has been made public is that persons linked to the hierarchy of the APNU AFC coalition government are part of what can only be described as a rape of Guyana's resources. Uh, we actually saw lands being issued uh, in President Granger's name to persons right within the Ministry of the Presidency, three persons in particular. We saw Marlon Bristol, who is head of the Project Management Office within the Ministry of the Presidency. He has received one acre in Moka, which is in Region 4, 12 acres in Linden, 80 acres in Bohemia, which is Region 6. And specifically, at the locations in Linden and Bohemia, mm -hmm. they're near Deepwater Harbor locations. Mm -hmm. And this was done uh, in June 2019 and February 2019, respectively. We also saw Aubrey Heath Retimaya. He's the deputy head of SARA, which falls under the Ministry of the Presidency. And he would have received 10 acres of land in Linden and one acre of land in Mocha. And then surprisingly, we saw, or not so surprisingly, we saw Eric Phillips. Mm -hmm. He was also the recipient of, of several uh, hundred acres of land, I would say. Uh, he is the SAR, he is SARA's special assistant within the Ministry of the Presidency. He received a thousand acres of land in the Esquibo River wow. and a thousand <laughs> acres of land in the Demerara River. And all of this was done in 2019 following uh, the, the no, no confidence, confidence motion, motion yes, yes. that was passed last year. Well, the issue is clear um, for all to see, as you said, yes. all these uh, uh, lands that were processed and done after the no confidence motion was passed. But what's happening is that ordinary Guyanese yes. are um, continuing to suffer the hardship imposed by the coalition government and by their policies, and more so um, their inability to access basic basic needs such as a house or getting yes. a house lot. In Indeed. fact, not a single house lot has been processed in the five wow. years that the coalition government has been in office. Wow. Uh, but rather you see wanton and obscene land grabbing and it's only benefiting a select few. As you can see, those are all, um, you know, persons that are linked closely to the government in high-ranking officials yes, exactly. and stuff like this. Um, in fact, only last week we saw the Minister of Housing now, and this yeah. portfolio keeps shifting all the time. Yes, uh, well, times. the current Minister of Housing, Annette Ferguson, uh, telling Guyanese on the East Coast of Demerara that they have to wait another 18 months to get their house loss application even looked at, wow. uh, which is surprising. All the while, all those that are linked to the hierarchy of the government or to the coalition are, um, you know, benefiting from lands in strategic yes, locations. That's great. Uh, in fact, uh, the locations that, and you mentioned this one, is that some of the areas that you highlighted there are where the, the government yes. has plans to build uh, shore base facilities, right. deep water harbors, and other major infrastructural um, developments. And, you know, it has been about two weeks now and we still have not received any word uh, or any statement that has not come from President Granger on what has happened um, with these lands. And it is the same silence we have seen on the plethora of corruption scandals that have plagued us in the last four years. Uh, I would say in the last go the government's uh, term in office over the last four years, several of which have been documented and pronounced on by the Public Procurement Commission. We saw them releasing several reports uh, on several matters and several scandals under this government. Yeah, definitely. Uh, in fact, it doesn't even stop at uh, just lands uh, yes. being issued out. In fact, just earlier today, we saw a report from the GGMC where yeah. they uh, claim that they are, um, they have intentions to grant a uh, prospecting license to Tino Guyana Development Estates. That's wow. T-I-N-O Guyana Development Estates is a company um, 
And surprisingly, the company, uh, the company documents, uh, uh, it shows that the principal of this company is the head of the Guyana Water Incorporated, uh, oh Mr. Van West Charles. Van West Charles. So um, the others uh, involved in this is um, Van West Charles, Lee Goring, and Roxy Paris. They have applied for medium scale permit, um, okay. ex prospecting permit to explore for gold and diamond on a track of state land so in the Pataro mining river. An another business yes, now. Yes, yes. Uh, we see. recall Mr. Van West Charles was the one involved with the um, fuel in the Marijuana fuel, okay, and fuel yes. smuggling. He was recently accosted by the uh, GRA for that. So now he's getting into gold and diamond mining and again uh, this is prime lands and prime locations that has been given priority to these uh, friends and families of yes. the coalition government now this begs the question the, why the sun rush to grant all these license and process these uh, these uh, applications yes. for state yes. lands um, when ordinary Guyanese have been waiting for over four years for something as simple as a house lot and cannot get any I have no doubt, Rudy, we will not get an answer on that question. I, Definitely. I not, and I, I think it's the same silence we have seen from Eric, Fee, Eric, Eric Phillips sorry, recently. Uh, Eric Phillips, we know, is heading the probe being done by the state's asset recovery agency, that is SARA, into the award of the Kaichur and the Kanji oil blocks by the mm -hmm. former PPPC government under Donald Ramatar. Mm -hmm. And we saw, we are seeing daily in the newspaper that episode playing out. Uh, however, leaked documents from the GGMC show that Phillips, Eric Phillips, who also has no track record mm -hmm. in oil exploration, is one of the beneficial owners of a company called ABR, Oil and Gas Exploration. This company has applied for a license to explore that block mm -hmm. that is adjoining to Kaichur and Kanji, and that is in Block C. Eric Phillips nor his partners have any track record. They don't have any track record mm -hmm. of exploration and development of offshore blocks. Mm -hmm. That means they don't have the capacity to drill for mm -hmm. deep water or ultra deep water uh, mm -hmm. oil. They don't have the capacity to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not uh, a case that you're, you're drilling in, in the interior. This is, <laughs> yeah, this, is a different, yeah. this is a different scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, this is despite the fact that the full disclosure on technical competence and previous experience in oil prospecting or oil field development work, including a record of petroleum exploration and production in Guyana and elsewhere. So what was the end game here? Uh, probe the Kaichur and Kanji oil blocks, the same area where Eric Phillips has an interest, and then what? Mm -hmm. Because if he's going to be undertaking uh, investigation into that area mm -hmm. and then he has an interest in that area what can Guyanese expect coming out of the investigation I mean this is a clear conflict of interest definitely and in fact um, one of the main things that they've been going on is that some of these companies that were uh, issue the permits to prospect under the former president yes. their major plank of, of starting this investigation uh, actually is that these companies don't have any um, any, experience any experience with dealing with oil and gas or dealing with yes, and we, saw, uh, we see who are the players involved in the mm -hmm. ABR uh, oil and gas exploration uh, mm -hmm. of course the are some engineers and some people who, are, who have some amount of uh, experience in another area, but exactly. not when it comes to drilling in deep water mm -hmm. and ultra deep water mm -hmm. harbor location. Th this, is, this is something completely different and they don't mm -hmm. have the adequate experience to do this. Mm -hmm. So we really have to consider what is the end game here for Eric Phillips, mm -hmm. who is probing an area that he has an interest in. Exactly. Um, <laughs> you can tell that the investigation is no doubt going to be biased or the findings yes, of that I investigation. Mean, are going to be and just to uh, um, put in that the ABR is the African Business Roundtable. Yes, it's the same right. same company. Um, they would have set up along with several others who yes. are also high-ranking officials within the coalition yes. government. Um, so let's move on now. One to um, Minister Jordan. Rather interesting week we've had okay. this week here. Yes. Um, yes, very interesting. So it would seem that the government has. <laughs> absolutely no interest in being accountable to the people of Guyana. In fact, uh, this week, the President Granger stepped in and issued uh, a grant of respite, he called it, 
blocking Minister Jordan from being imprisoned for 21 days. Wow. Um, now, the facts of the matter are these. Um, the judgment in the case was handed down in October of 2015. Yes. So there have been a, a lot of debate over this matter in the social media and also um, elsewhere, yes. where persons are claiming that this judgment, uh, they inherited it, it was PPP, granted yes. for the PPP, <laughs> and it's unfair that yeah. this Minister of Finance has to face the yeah. jail for another minister's <laughs> thing. No, that was not so. This judgment was handed down by Rishi Prasad in October of 2015, a full six months after the coalition yes. uh, thereabout would have uh, taken over office. Yes, that's for, the, uh, for the past four years, Minister Jordan has refused to comply with the judgment in total disregard for the court. Now, moving on from that, um, the lawyers involved uh, battling for Dipcon Engineering yeah. Services Limited went to the court, as anyone would do, to compel the minister to pay the judgment. So what happened was um, earlier in May, the coalition government went back to parliament asking for supplementary in the sum of over uh, think seven billion Ghana dollars of which uh, several billion was highlighted to pay this judgment. Of course, the money was never paid over and the minister is currently, what, well, was currently facing 21 days imprisonment, which yes. then the president <laughs> stepped in. So last night, uh, we saw a strong statement from the uh, Private Sector Commission on, mm -hmm. this, on this exact issue. And I just want to read a bit of, a bit of what the press statement said. It said, a quote, The Private Sector Commission has observed with great concern the deliberate and repeated refusal on the part of the government to honor the judgment of the court with regard to a payment owed to Dipcon Engineering Services Limited since 2009. The rule of law must prevail if business is to be conducted in our country with confidence in the government's respect for the judiciary and a separation of powers between the executive and courts. The private sector must at all times be confident that the principles of sanctity of contracts reinforced by the independence of the courts will be honored by the state. The intervention of the president to protect the minister of finance from the law rather than to encourage him to pay the amount owed and thereby follow the rule of law sends a message that businesses and private investors can be wronged with impunity." Unquote. Uh, however, the coalition government seems unconcerned with this matter, mm -hmm. I would say. Very Definitely unconcerned. Very strong statement from the private sector there because this is actually setting a very dangerous precedent, yeah, what the president has done. So um, it's essentially saying that all the ministers, they, if you're taken to court and you have orders made against you, you could just, oh, I'm not going to adhere or listen to the court orders. And then when, when you're um, granted with an order of contempt, you beg, then beg the president to save you from going to jail, which we have seen he has done in this instance here. Yes. Um, in fact, uh, just recently, the leader of the opposition alluded to this fact as well, where he mentioned that um, this is dangerous for investors coming into Ghana and wanting to do business with a government that behaves in such a manner. Yes. It is totally reckless. And I think is on that same, um, the private sector sees it along those same lines. From what you said, Rudy, it seems that the underlying principle is the gov in the government's governance style of the AP and UAFC coalition government is self-interest. Mm -hmm. uh, we also see the continued push uh, to advance self-interest as opposed to constitutional compliance with regard, uh, sorry, with the repeated calls for house-to-house -house registration by almost every element of this administration. For our viewers, I would, just, I would just like to repeat the fact that the facts on this issue are very, very clear. Uh, house house registration, as, as proposed by the coalition government, is absolutely unnecessary. A claims and objections exercise that will address every justification they have raised to back up their calls for house to house registration. A claims and objections period will, one, allow any eligible Guyanese who have reached the age of 18 years old to be registered if their name is not on the voters list. Two, allow any eligible Guyanese to get a transfer from one voting district to another in the event that they change their place of residence. Allow any Guyanese citizen to do a name change. Allow for the removal of a dead person from the voters list. That was four. And lastly, number five, allow for objections to be made to the name of someone not eligible to be on the list. 
So we just want to specifically say once again that house to house registration is not necessary. It is just a ploy being used by the government to ensure that they can delay the mm -hmm. process much, much further. A claims and objections period can be facilitated within one month, and everyone has been saying this. Mm -hmm. Even the, the, uh, the legal expert that was within GCOM, she had similar sentiments on this issue. Mm -hmm. We've seen ton, tons of politicians, tons of analysts who have, who have made pronouncements on this issue. Mm -hmm. But the only, the only entity or the only fraction that mm -hmm. seems to be pushing household registration is the government. And of course, when uh, Mr. David Patterson was there, he was, he was being mm -hmm. used and GCOM was also making the same rhetoric. So once we have a claims and objections period, we will ensure that all Guyanese get the opportunity to cast their vote for the party of their choice. Thank you. Definitely. Um, on that note as well, this Friday, the 12th of July, yeah. the Caribbean Court of Justice will be making the final say in both these matters, the consolidated appeals challenging the no confidence motion. They already gave their ruling, but what they're going to do is give the effect to those ruling by making certain orders and also in the case uh, challenging the GCOM chairman, yeah. uh, Zulfikar versus the Attorney General, um, the GCOM chairman case, they will be also making orders in that matter on Friday as well. Now, if you'd like to read what uh, Mr. Mustafa, Zulfikar Mustafa, and the leader of the opposition are asking the CCJ for, there's a link to the submissions, yes. the post-judgment submissions correct. on the PPP's Facebook page. Okay. So you guys can head over there and just take a brief look at those submissions and get a deep understanding of what exactly the PPP uh, is asking for in relation to these matters, especially uh, where it concerns house to house and the appointment of a chairman of GCOM, which we'll be speaking about a bit later on in the yes. program. Um, the other issue actually uh, dominating, um, as I said earlier, is the appointment of a chairman of GCOM. Yes. We know that the CCJ ruled uh, saying that the appointment of Mr. David Patterson was unconstitutional. Um, speaking on this matter, just recently was um, the leader of the opposition, Mr. Barrett Jagdio, and we have a clip actually of him um, highlighting certain issues on the ongoing process. Let's take a listen. There has been some confusion in the public domain surrounding the process through which we will appoint the next chairman of GCOM. Now, I want to quickly recap what took place to give viewers an indication of the clarity that we had surrounding the process. So sometime last week, we received a letter from Mr. Harmon indicating that their interpretation of the CCJ's ruling is that the president will have a role in selecting nominees for the position of the chairperson of GCOM. My office responded and indicated in that response that the CCJ ruling did not change the constitution of Guyana. That therefore, the constitutional process has to be followed. And what does the constitution of Guyana say on this matter? It says that the leader of the opposition has to submit six names not unacceptable to the president from which he will select one person. So the lead, it is the leader of the opposition who has to submit the names. And secondly, that the process of selecting the six should be through consultations with the non-governmental political par parties in parliament. And there is only one non-governmental political party in parliament now, and that's the People's Progressive Party. So the ruling of the CCJ urged a consultative process. It says that we must communicate in good faith and perhaps meet to 
try to hammer out a list of names in an informal process uh, after which the formal submission will be made, made. The CCJ did not say that the Constitution is now overturned. So we pointed this out to Mr. Harmon in the, the response and we said, however, in the informal discussions, we will not be averse to the president submitting or suggesting names for my consideration, because there may be names that the president would suggest that in my determination of the final six, they could be included. And so we were not averse to that. The president has now submitted eight names, and those names are in the public domain. But before I go there, <clears throat> let me talk a bit about the meeting we had with the president just last week. At that meeting, we sought to clarify the process moving forward. So we agreed that, that there would be the informal discussions and that we will name representatives, which we, we have done. But the responsibility um, still remains, the, or, the, or the responsibilities still remain those of the president and the leader of the opposition. And that our representatives will meet almost continuously to consider the names submitted. So we, we further agreed that we will look at the first 18 names that I had submitted, appropriately adjusted, and, and then resubmit those names for consideration in the informal discussion um, who have given their consent to do so. I asked the 18 persons and 11 of them consented to have their names resubmitted, which we did. So further at the meeting, we, we had an agreement that the constitution of Guyana was not changed by the CCJ ruling. And that a lot of what the CCJ had done was to, and, or their, their advice was advisory in nature that we should engage each other to avoid the contention uh, that we had in the past. So I was very heartened when the president himself came and held a press conference and he said, one, the CCJ ruling had not changed the constitution of Guyana. And to, in today's press statement, from the government and in the address to the nation, I did not see him mention the constitution of Guyana, but on the, at the press conference just after the meeting, he admitted and he said to the nation that the constitution of Guyana remained unchanged by the CCJ's ruling, and therefore its provisions have to be fully applied. Two, he said, submitting names to him Self that he has to reappoint. Something to that effect will be like, it, it would, I, I can't remember the exact words, but it would be like submitting names to himself to reappoint. And that's not the way the constitution should work. And the third issue he mentioned at the press conference, that former chairman of elections commission, Patterson is part of electoral history. So, None of that view is represented in today's press conference and the press statement. No, the, the press statement that was, that was issued by the government and the address to the nation. So when we went to the meeting yesterday, uh, my representatives went to the meeting, they were given the names of eight persons and were told that they had no instructions to discuss the 11. Now, the government could have easily sent the eight names to us in a letter 
They didn't need to convene a meeting to do so, but they did so. And today the meeting has, re has convened again. Let us hope that we move forward with that understanding, the understanding that we had, and the understanding that is still the most important thing for Guyana, that the constitution of Guyana must be upheld. The CCJ did not change the constitution vis-a-vis -vis the submission of names. And, and so, the eight names submitted by the president, I, want, I don't have anything adverse to say about any of those individuals. I do not want to engage in a public process of destroying people's characters, etc. I have nothing adverse to say about them. President has made the suggestions in line with my letter and I am prepared to consider the names to see whether they will be included in my final six that I submit to him. So the process that is ongoing now is an informal process. The formal process will be when I submit the six names to, to him. And this informal process is to see if we can find some commonality around names. So the discretion remains that of the leader of the opposition in accordance with our constitution to determine the final six. And I will, as I said before, I'll treat the president's suggestion seriously, but the determination will be mine whether they will form part of the official list of six persons that I submit to him. I hope this offers clarity to many people out there um, because of the confusion surrounding this issue and the government's insistence on quoting out of context many sections of the CCJ's ruling without emphasizing as the president himself agreed to and emphasized at his press conference that the constitution of Ghana in relation to the appointment of Chik, the chairman of GCOM remained or remains unchanged and that the role of the leader of the opposition is clearly defined in that uh, provision of the constitution. Welcome back to This Week in 60 Minutes and tonight I'm joined with PPPC parliamentarian Bishop Juan Edgehill who is a representative or a part of the team of representative meeting with um, the government's representative, he's actually representing the leader of the opposition along with Ms. Gail Teixeira and Mohabir Anil Nandlal. Uh, in the informal process, which you just heard the opposition leader speaking about, um, as it relates to getting to a consensus in the issue of appointing a chairman of the Guyana Elections Commission. Um, welcome to the show, Bishop. I know you're no stranger to this show. <laughs> Thank you and very good evening to all your viewers. Okay, well, to move things uh, straight into the informal negotiations that have been taking place for the past two days, um, what happened was the CCJ in their ruling said that, and I will quote directly here from the ruling of the CCJ, uh, they said that through a process of consultation, dialogue and compromise between the president and the leader of the opposition, and that this process is to be completed before the list is formally submitted by the leader of the opposition to the president. Now, you guys have been meeting informally for the past two days. Um, where do we stand currently uh, with the 11 names that were being considered during this period? Well, Steve and viewers, it's no secret that when the lead of the opposition met with the president on July 4th, there was an agreement that the 18 original names that were submitted on three different occasions would be modified and resubmitted to the president for consideration. That took us down to 11 because seven of the persons could not or did not want to go forward at this time. Mm -hmm. for different reasons. The 11 names that were submitted, we met. And the first day when we met, rather than us considering 
the 11 names that the leader of the opposition submitted, mm. the very first thing that confronted the negotiating team was a document with eight suggestions from the president. Yesterday, we were able to examine the 11 names that were submitted by the leader of the opposition. And at the end of that meeting, we had some vague understanding of which clarity is still being sought. Four of the persons were considered shortlisted. Two were considered to be under active consideration. I've noticed a news, uh, online news source saying two had the all clear. That's erroneous. Mm -hmm. And five of those names were rejected with the president's team of representatives giving some reasons of why the rejection was there. So that's where we are on that. Okay, well, earlier today we saw the Office of the Leader of the Opposition releasing um, to the media and the public a letter sent on behalf of the Leader of the Opposition, um, Dr. Barajaydeo, um, yeah, Ms. Gail Teixeira, on behalf of the Leader of the Opposition, sending a letter to Harman seeking clarity on these vague terms, as you mentioned earlier, um, on the active consideration, shortlisted, and rejected with reasons. Is there anything that... Well, th th there's a reason why that letter mm. was written. Because when we were closing the meeting yesterday, we sought clarity on what information could we take back to the leader of the opposition as it relates to the shortlisting, active consideration, rejected. Mm -hmm. And we ask, could we say to the leader of the opposition, from the list of 11, mm -hmm. four have reached the criteria of not unacceptable to the president, and two is under active consideration, which might very well mean that these discussions could come to an end. Mm -hmm. The leader of the opposition and the president could now sit and talk, because you have six out of 11, mm -hmm. and it's a list of six to be submitted. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, at that stage, we were told, no, 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 no. The four that are shortlisted are tending towards acceptability. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we were confused, mm -hmm. or we might want to use the other term, flummoxed. Mm -hmm. And we have now sought, mm -hmm. not for the, I would say, for the avoidance of any doubt, mm -hmm. to document what these terms mean mm -hmm. so that the leader of the opposition is properly guided on the way forward and that we get this process moving. We were expecting to meet today again mm -hmm. because remember the leader of the opposition says he's prepared to meet every day until this process. It mm -hmm. is the government that is unavailable for today. That is why right. there are no yes. meetings for today. A serious matter mm -hmm. like the appointment are getting the list hammered out mm -hmm. for the names of the chairman of GCOM, the government is not available today. Mm -hmm. And they would, we are going to meet tomorrow. And it is their hope, based upon what they're saying, they're hoping that everything will be completed tomorrow. Now, if they're hoping that everything mm -hmm. to be completed tomorrow, we cannot wait until we go tomorrow to have these terms defined. Mm -hmm. So the, okay. the leader of the opposition's representatives, we have determined mm -hmm. that we should get these terms properly documented so when we enter on Thursday, we're not trying to find clarity of what concluded on Tuesday, but we are moving forward. Definitely. Well, I think all of Guyana would agree with you um, on that position because we know the government have a tendency of negotiating in bad faith and, you know, reneging on their promises and a lot of that. Um, there seems to be some confusion as to the president's role in this, um, in this process. In fact, the CCJ says um, in their judgment at paragraph 27, in our view, employment of the double negative unacceptable signals that an onus is placed on the president not to find a nominee acceptable, unacceptable merely because the nominee is not a choice the president would have himself made. The president should also find a nominee 
unacceptable for some good reason on objective grounds. If a president were permitted capriciously or whimsically without proffering a good reason to reject eligible nominees, this would frustrate the proper working of the consultations. Now, can you simplify this uh, for the viewers? Well, the way that I could explain it is we went, well, not we, yes, I should use the term, we ended up mm -hmm. at the CCJ for clarification as it relates to mm -hmm. Article 161, mm -hmm. 2 of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Now, this Constitution of Guyana is the supreme law of the land. Mm -hmm. The society is supposed to be rules-based. And you don't make up the rules as you go along. The That's rules right. are documented mm -hmm. in this Constitution. The Constitution says, the leader of the opposition shall submit six names to the president that are not unacceptable to him. Mm -hmm. The president shall choose one. The leader of the opposition submitted three lists of six, 18 names. Mm -hmm. The president rejected all, offered no reasons, mm -hmm. and unilaterally appointed Justice Retired Patterson. Mm -hmm. We went to court. The CCJ says, no, 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 no. You can't do it like that. The role of the leader of the opposition, according to the Constitution, is that he must give you six names mm -hmm. that are not unacceptable to you. You pick one. Now, the rejection of a person cannot just be because you don't like the person or because you would not have chosen that person. Mm -hmm. It must be on objective grounds. You must find valid reasons of why you're rejecting. Because mm -hmm. if you continue to do like that, then this process will be dragged on and on and on and on and on. And then the whole issue of the, the leader of the opposition making submissions will be thrown out of the window because a president could always find no list acceptable and he moves on to the unilateral to the appointment. Yeah, unilateral appointment. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the judges at the court at paragraph 28 also indicate that once the leader of the opposition mm -hmm. shows a willingness to engage in good faith in the process, the proviso, which means the, the, the president's move mm -hmm. to without the participation of the leader of the opposition appointing a chairman does not apply. Mm -hmm. In this case, the leader of the opposition is engaged and has always been engaged. So moving to that provision for unilateral appointment does not apply once the leader of the opposition is in place. Now, there seems to be some confusion at this stage based upon um, the rulings and the guidance of the, the court mm -hmm. that the president can submit mm -hmm. names and, and as, as if the Constitution was rewritten or amended by the CCJ. The CCJ at no time at all mm -hmm. has the power, the authority, or did not in any way amend the Constitution. Mm -hmm. It is still the leader of the opposition who has to submit names. Mm -hmm. The president has to pick one. Definitely. Now, in, in giving of that guidance, mm -hmm. the court suggested that there could possibly be an informal engagement between the president and the leader of the opposition where there could be some discussion mm -hmm. and six names could be hammered out that are not unacceptable to the president mm -hmm. and then a submission is made and the president picks one. The process that we are involved in, myself, Madam Gail Teixeira, and Mr. Anil Nandalal, along with Mr. Joseph Harmon, Vala Lawrence, and Kemre Dramchatan, mm -hmm. is that informal process of hammering out mm -hmm. names. But ultimately, mm -hmm. the Constitution of Guyana, mm -hmm. it is the leader of the opposition taking the views that came from those discussions that will have to submit 
the six names. And that is one reason why we're seeking clarity on the terms mm -hmm. so that the leader of the opposition will be properly guided. No time would be lost or wasted or we are not having any confusion about interpretation because this government has a serious problem with interpretation of language, even the simplest of language. Well, just to give the viewers a bit of background as to um, what you were saying, um, what actually happened was at paragraphs 28 in the ruling, the CCJ said, and I quote, this approach gives the president a role in the identification of six names, but it obviates the possibility that after the formal presentation of the list, the president could suggest that one or more of the names, or indeed the entire list, is unacceptable. Um, the, the letter that Mr. Harmon wrote to the leader of the opposition, they're interpreting this, this paragraph to say that the president can submit names of his own. And at that meeting, I recall um, the leader of the opposition saying that he is not adverse to, in the informal process, having them put forward names and so forth. In the discussion. Mm -hmm. In the discussion. But what, what, what they did is, well, that, uh, is that they made a formal submission exactly. of eight names. Well, there's my next question to you. We know that the government, uh, the president's representative rather, made a formal submission of eight names. Those, uh, the names are Stanley Ming, Kim Kite, Cassandra Owls, Arbrey Armstrong, Claudette LaBennett, Stanley Moore, Kadim Khan, and Justice James Patterson retired <laughs> again. So um, does this signal a bad faith in your view or that of the view of the leader of the opposition? Well, I don't know if I should or I can mm -hmm. accurately reflect the views of the leader of the opposition on a program like this since <laughs> I'm one of his representatives in the negotiations. Mm -hmm. But I can certainly say mm -hmm. when we received the representatives of the leader of the opposition received that list mm -hmm. of eight names, which was a formal submission, mm -hmm. we were alarmed. And then when we looked at the list, mm -hmm. my colleague inquired if the Justice Patterson was the same Justice Patterson that just demitted office at GCOM since the president in a post-July 4th meeting between himself and the leader of the opposition, mm -hmm. described Mr. Patterson as part of our electoral history. Yes. Now, and he did mention that he don't want to go back to that. He don't want to go, back, want to to go back to so, that. Now, if Mr. Patterson is part of our ele electoral history, I think any first form student understands that language. Mm -hmm. How could the president, through his representatives, submit a list and say, look, if you come to me with any of these eight persons, or you choose six from this eight, they are all not unacceptable for me. I'll be comfortable. Mm -hmm. In the CVs that were submitted, mm -hmm. two of these persons, not mm -hmm. what the public is saying. This is not what the public is saying. Mm -hmm. So even if the president or his representative suffered a memory lapse, the person's CVs that were presented to us indicated that two of those persons mm -hmm. are politically affiliated to the ruling, to I should say, the major party of the ruling coalition, which is the PNCR. Mm -hmm. They stated that in their CV. Oh. They served as members of parliament and as executive and all the rest of it. Oh, just to share with the viewers. One of those persons mm -hmm. could have ended up being a presidential candidate mm -hmm. for the PNCR had he had seven years res residency in Guyana not so long ago. No. And I don't want to have to use this program to dissect the list, but mm -hmm. people in Guyana are aware of who these persons mm -hmm. are. So when the president sent politically tainted persons, a chairman that was unilaterally appointment that was deemed, his appointment was deemed unconstitutional and flawed, mm -hmm. and then you have persons who are active politically today mm -hmm. on that list, whose photographs have appeared mm -hmm. in the media with APNU jerseys in APNU activities, and you put that on the list. Mm -hmm. It's either you're seeking to provoke 
either you, it's, it's a transparent ploy for delay mm -hmm. or you were seeking to elicit some kind of a response. Mm -hmm. But at all material times, as representatives of the leader of the opposition, we are operating in good faith, mm -hmm. even if bad faith is on the table, mm -hmm. because we are plowing through, pressing on to ensure that we get a chairman of GCOM. There must be no excuse given mm -hmm. that you know, the, the opposition tried to hold up this process. So even in the midst of that, we are plowing on. Okay, um, just to let the viewers know, the persons that uh, Mr. Bishop would have alluded to, we, Mr. Stanley Ming, who is 68 years of age, is a former PNCR member of parliament between the years of 2001 to 2006. And he was also a member of the PNCR list of candidates for several general and regional elections. Uh, Ms. Kim Kite was the litigant in the government case on the challenge to the appointment of Patterson on the GCOM chairman. And you can see her there on your screen dressed in AP and UAFC garbs. Ms. Cassandra Isles, who was in her 40s as well, is the daughter of Kester Isles, a spokes Alves. Alves. Alves, sorry, a spokesperson for the former Forbes Barnum led PNC government and advisor to Mr. Barnum. Arbery Armstrong, who is in his 80s, is a card-bearing PNCR member and was a contender for the PNCR leadership not so long ago. He was also on several uh, lists of candidates for the PNCR. Miss um, Claudette LaBennett in her late 70s is seen as being very close affiliate of the PNCR and the coalition government. Mr. Stanley Moore, who is in his late 80s, was the former PNCR Minister of Home Affairs. Kadim Khan, uh, 67, was a former PNCR Member of Parliament between the years 1998 to 2000. He was Treasurer for the PNCR from 1996 to 2000 and is a member of the Central Executive of the PNC. And of course, he as well has been on several lists of candidates contesting the regional general elections on behalf of the PNCR. And of course, Mr. James Patterson is no stranger to the Guyanese public. So those are the eight persons which um, uh, the government representative would have formally submitted to the leader. Saying of the to us, because we sought clarification, mm -hmm. if this list had the approval of the president, mm -hmm. and if all eight of these persons are deemed to be not unacceptable, to him. Uh -huh. And they confirmed, yes, this came from the president, and none of these persons mm -hmm. would be rejected by the president if they find their way on a list mm -hmm. coming from the leader of the opposition. Interesting. Um, the president team of representative negotiations has signaled that they want to have the informal discussions completed before the end of the week. Um, of course, in the ruling at paragraph 51, the CCJ said that um, the giving of reasons by the president will ensure transparency and accountability to the people, avoid unilateralism and arbitrariness, and engender public trust and confidence in the Elections Commission. Now, we know that the president has to give reasons for any person that he may deem not, on, not acceptable to him. Um, can you expound on this a bit uh, as to the four that were rejected with reasons were the reasons given? Five, 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 sorry. Five. Were they, were, are you in possession of these reasons? And As a representative of the leader of the opposition mm -hmm. who are part of the talks, um, at those hammering out processes or hammering out meetings, reasons were offered. Okay. It does not mean that we agree mm -hmm. with the reasons that were given. Some were one word, and some was just a line. I'm at, sure at, that's at, not what the CCJ meant, a one at, word as a reason. At this particular stage, I don't think we would want to make public, because mm -hmm. it's a small society, Definitely. What, who said what. We're not going to get involved in that, because mm -hmm. we're operating in good faith. But the CCJ said the giving of reasons will ensure transparency and accountability to the people Definitely. The president must give reasons because that will allow for transparency and accountability to the people who he leads. Mm -hmm. It will avoid unilateralism and arbitrariness. 
And we must have a chairman who enjoys public trust, confidence, and a commission that could really go ahead and do its work. So we are hopeful that when these informal talks are completed and the leader of the opposition submits a list of six mm -hmm. to the president, the president's actions, if he's not going to accept that list, mm -hmm. it just can be the list is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. He will have to give reasons for the rejection of anyone, or, and, and it, 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 it must be mm -hmm. there. So at this stage, where we are talking in the informal talks, yeah. mm -hmm. those reasons that were given mm -hmm. are considered to be, you know, the informal yeah. engagement. Mm -hmm. You may not want to consider A, B, and C because yeah, of nice. this. You may not, this might not be acceptable. Of course, to we're the speaking here of the formal list when it's submitted. We're talking six. here yeah. now. Mm -hmm. The only time there is a submission mm -hmm. that is deemed to be formal mm -hmm. is when the lead of the opposition having had these discussions or talks between his representatives, or if he and the president himself decides to have informal talks, mm -hmm. when the lead of the opposition, acting in his constitutional capacity, submits to the president, says, these six names are my submissions mm -hmm. because I had an obligation to, according to the Constitution, to give you six names after I would have consulted with the non-governmental parties in the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. In this case, the only non-governmental party in the National Assembly is the People's Progressive Party, Civic. Mm -hmm. If the president rejects any of those, he has to give mm -hmm. reasons, because that is the time when the formal submission is going to be made. Um, well, moving on as terms of this, um, there also seems to be some confusion in the president's mind about the ability to make a unilateral appointment. In fact, the CCJ said that unilateral appointment by the president in keeping with the proviso to Article 161.2 can hardly be an option if the leader of the opposition demonstrates a willingness to engage in good faith the process outlined above. And the president himself has said this, and I quote, the only difference I can say is that where someone does not conform to those art particular criteria, the president has the option, which is clearly stated, of acting in his own considered judgment if he feels that the names or the list submitted were not in accordance with the criteria laid down in the Constitution. Now, the CCJ ruling is quite clear, and I've just read what the CCJ said. We all, we've been speaking here about the informal process, and they said that once the leader of the opposition is willing to engage in good faith, then this cannot be done. Now, we're running out of time, so in closing, what are your thoughts on what the president is saying and what is happening here? Is this just, are we just going through a motion as a show, if, or? If the president continues in that mindset, He's actually saying to the people of Guyana, mm -hmm. I have, like he said, I did nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. And I've said before, once wrong was done mm -hmm. and there's no acknowledgement, it can be done again. Mm -hmm. the, and it, the truth about it, if there was a court higher than the CCJ that they could have gone to, mm -hmm. they would have kept going. You know why? Because it's buying them time and it's playing into a grand scheme of delay, delay, delay. The CCJ is our final court in our judicial architecture. Mm -hmm. The CCJ has pronounced. Once the leader of the opposition is engaging, mm -hmm. you cannot unilaterally appoint. So the people of Ghana could be assured. Mm -hmm. There will be, and there cannot be, any unilateral appointment because the leader of the opposition is engaged and the leader of the opposition intends at the appropriate time, we hope sooner rather than later, mm -hmm. to submit six names for the president to pick one so we can have a chairman of GCOM so that we can get elections in keeping with our constitution, which says mm -hmm. 90 days after the passage of a no-confidence motion, mm -hmm. there shall be elections. So the government must not use the appointment of a chairman of GCOM as a way of not mm -hmm. having elections. We know the story of house-to-house -house registration, mm -hmm. and this seems to be another one. Now we so we are, that on the no matter how bad fate they are operating in, that's why we're seeking clarity, that's why we're keeping the public updated. That's why we're behaving in a very responsible manner. Mm -hmm. And we will continue to discharge that responsibility in the informal discussions on behalf of the leader of the opposition to ensure that the safety 
and future of this country is not jeopardized by us being in unconstitutional territory and, 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 and where we're not covered by the rule of law. Because we are there, this is, today I think it's 200 days mm -hmm. since the passage of the no confidence motion. Oh. And today is 200 days. And all the people in Guyana who have become willfully blind, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, okay, and, 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 and I should say, uh, they have become silent out of necessity. I think <clears throat> it is time that they see and speak that the Constitution of Guyana must be upheld. That is why we went to court, because the con Constitution was breached. Mm -hmm. The government said they didn't do anything wrong. The court found them an error. You cannot go back there. All right, thank you. Um, Bishop Juan Edgel, once again for being on the program. A quick recap before we close off here. We dealt with um, the PNC big wigs, um, friends and cronies of the PNC uh, who are busy grabbing and collecting lands for themselves among other parks in office. Uh, the, we dealt with the issue of the contempt of court of Minister Jordan and of course the house to house registration dispelling those lies affiliated with those. And we spent the last 30 minutes or so speaking about the process of appointing um, the chairman of the Guyana Elections Commission. So thank you for being with us for the last hour or so. We hope you join us next week. Until then, goodbye and have a good night. <laughs>